Well, every year, like clockwork, right around January 1st, parking lots of gyms all over the country fill up as people make the New Year's resolution to lose weight or to get in shape. And if you're a gym-going person, you know that it'll be hard to find a parking spot. Uh, you might not be able to get into some classes because they are full when they typically aren't. You may have to wait for equipment from about the first week in January until about the second week in February, because about 80% of those who make a New Year's resolution, about 80% of those people abandon them at about the six week mark. And um, so when that happens, the gym goes back to its normal traffic until next January when the whole process is repeated over again. And regardless of if we're considering some weight loss plan, or purchasing a product or service, or maybe considering adopting some strategy into our lives, we would all do well to ask two very important questions. One, will this actually work? You know, when you're considering buying a product or purchasing a service or just adopting some strategy in your life, it's important to ask the question, will this work? Will it actually be able to accomplish what it promises. And a second question that may not be quite as obvious, but it is equally as important as this, how long should I expect to wait before I begin to see results? And the reason why that second question is just as important as the first is because, as I mentioned earlier, about 80% of those who make a New Year's resolution to lose weight, about 80% of them quit by about week six but a general rule of thumb that's helpful to know is when someone is on a weight loss program, it usually takes about eight weeks to see visible results. And it's sad to think about. People rearrange their lives and drag themselves to the gym and maybe eat more uh, conscientiously than they typically would, and they invest for six weeks and perhaps come to the conclusion, hey, this isn't producing any results, there's no return on investment here, and they prematurely throw the towel in just a week or two before they're about to see results and turn the corner and have some fruit for their labors. And today, as we wrap up this three-week study through the book of Haggai, we're gonna learn two important truths about God's promises. And in essence, we're gonna have those same two questions answered for us as it relates to God's promises. One, will God's promises actually work? Are they powerful enough to change my life? Are they capable of bringing about life change? Can they deliver on what they promise? And the second question we're gonna have answered is, how long should I expect to wait before I see God's blessings actually showing up in my life? So if you have a Bible, I would invite you at this time to turn or click to Haggai chapter two, and we're gonna jump into verses 15 and 19 as we wrap up this book this morning. Haggai 2, 15 through 19 says this, now then consider from this day onward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. And when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing but from this day on, I will bless you. You know, as we're looking at today's passage, in order to understand it, we kind of have to back up and do a mini recap of the past few weeks to kind of understand what's going on here. And if you were with us a few weeks ago when we began to study through the book of Haggai, you'll remember that God spoke through the prophet Haggai and he told him to give his people a message to resume building the temple. Because you see, God's people had been brought back into their homeland about 15 years before the book of Haggai, and they were there, and for 15 years, they were disobedient to God's command to build a temple. 
So for 15 years, they were disobedient, they refused to obey God, they refused to build the temple, and after 15 years, the prophet Haggai shows up on the scene, commissioned by God, and explains that there are some punishments, there are some punishments, rather, for their disobedience. We read about that in Haggai chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. God says this, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little, and what you brought home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, that is the temple, that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. So God gives a message to Haggai and Haggai is to deliver that message to God's people. And in a nutshell, he's basically saying, for 15 long years, you've been disobedient. You have not fulfilled the mission I've given you to build a temple And as a result, I have cursed your economy. I've cursed the land. I've cursed the ground. And when you plant and you go to reap what you have planted, you're amazed at how little you're actually bringing in. You're not sure how to understand what's going on. Why is the produce performing so poorly? And God says, it's because I have removed my blessings from you. I've cursed the land so that you'll turn back to me. And amazingly, God's people, upon hearing this message, immediately respond with obedience. We read about that in Haggai chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Very quickly, it says this, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua and of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of God on the 24th day of the sixth month. So God speaks through Haggai, and on the 24th day of the sixth month, his people begin to obey. They understand that their economy has been cursed because of their disobedience, and on the 24th day of the sixth month, they begin to obey. But look at what we just read in Haggai 2, 18. God says this, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day, not of the sixth month, but of the ninth month, and he goes on to say in verse 19, from this day onward, I will bless you. This means that God's people, as far as we can tell, were perfectly obedient for three long months. They put in their blood, sweat, and tears, and they toiled to relay the foundation of the temple, to move heavy stones, to do construction work, to cut down heavy trees, to bring them long distances to be obedient to the Lord their God. They were obedient for three entire months, and during those three months, there was not a slight hint of their economy being restored or their produce now beginning to perform in a way that they would expect it to. This brings us to the first truth we see in God's word today, and you may wanna jot this down in the notes section of your bulletin. We see this in God's word. Oftentimes, there's a delay between when God's people obey and when God's blessings arrive. I'm gonna say that again. Oftentimes, there's a delay between when God's people obey and when God's blessings arrive. And to be sure, in Haggai's day, the blessings that God promised for their obedience were blessings that were financial physical, and material. And I think if we're just being honest here, God does at times bless us, his people now, on occasion with financial or physical blessings. But by and large, when you read about the blessings of God, particularly in the New Testament, they're not so much physical blessings or material blessings, rather they are spiritual blessings. And I think the best clear picture of what those spiritual blessings look like that God has for his children would be found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Galatians 5, 22 says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Quick informal question here. If you would like at least one of those manifested in your life in a greater measure, more self-control or more gentleness or more patience, can you just raise your hand? Okay. 
It's essentially the whole room. We all desire greater contentment, greater tranquility, greater peace, greater patience, greater self-control. Those are no second-rate blessings. Those are the highest blessings that we can receive. And this passage teaches us that God, the Holy Spirit, works those out in our lives, but he doesn't do it automatically apart from our wills. We have a role to play in this, and we can see this a little further on in Galatians in the sixth chapter, verses seven through eight. Galatians six, seven through eight says the following. Do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Sticking with the idea of the fruit of the Spirit, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, is saying, whatever you plant, you get. If you plant garbage, you'll get garbage. If you plant seed and take care of it, you'll get whatever that seed produces. That is a law that is not changeable. And in verse eight of Galatians six, it says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. In other words, if we're planting things in our lives to gratify our sinful desires, we're gonna get those kind of plants. But if we plant things in our lives that are spiritual, that is what will be produced in our lives. And when you take these two passages together and combine them, you learn that yes, God the Holy Spirit works these spiritual blessings in our lives, but he does not do it just apart from our will. We have the responsibility to plant or sow to the Spirit. And we do that through things like reading God's word consistently, confessing sin regularly, giving thanks regularly, fellowshipping with other believers, worshiping, and the like. Those are the things we can do to plant and water the seeds in our life so that God, the Holy Spirit, can produce the fruit of the Spirit, such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, I think I think it's important for us to look at the image that God gives us for how he brings about these spiritual blessings in our lives. Because what he tells us in Galatians 5 is the process by which he makes an impatient person more patient and a harsh person more gentle and a hateful person more loving. The way he does that is not like flipping a light switch. It's like planting seed and waiting patiently over time. Notice he says it's the fruit of the Spirit. You see, in the land of Israel, one of the more common fruits, as I understand it, would be the pomegranate. And I've learned that if you plant a pomegranate plant or seed or however you do that, you'll have to wait five long years before it will actually produce any kind of fruit at all. And furthermore, you'd have to wait maybe 15 or 20 years before the fruit that that seed or that plant produces is all that palatable. And I think it's significant that when God says the spiritual blessings that come in our lives as a result of our obedience, those spiritual blessings, don't think of them like a giant on-off switch, which is how I would love for things to work. I would love for the moment I finally get sick of my impatience or my temper or my lack of self-control in whatever area of life, I would love it if there was a giant switch and I can just flip it and for the rest of my life, it would be a non-issue. But God's word tells us that process is one that is not instantaneous, but is something that is done over time in our lives, much the same way that fruit takes many, many years in order for it to be produced. Now, I realize it may sound like bad news at first that the spiritual blessings we want in our lives, more gentleness, more patience, more self-control, more contentment, you name it, it sounds like bad news, and to, to one degree it is, that it takes a long time. But knowing that is very, very helpful. Because if we don't have realistic expectations for what the timetable is in which God works in our lives to bring these spiritual blessings, we're gonna be dealing with a whole lot of unnecessary confusion and discouragement. Imagine somebody has had a problem with their temper for 50 years, and they've been a Christian for some years now, but they haven't been all that serious or focused about it. 
But they finally got sick enough of their temper that they've really realized, I can't control this, I need God's help, and they begin reading God's word regularly. They begin praying and confessing their sin, including when they lose their temper regularly. They get connected to a small group, they fellowship with others regularly. They're praying to God regularly, they're worshiping. Someone may be doing all those steps for days, weeks, months, perhaps even years before they really start to see tangible fruit, tangible results in their lives. And while that sounds like bad news, it's actually really helpful because if we think the moment we get serious about obedience in a day or two or a week or two, all of a sudden these long-standing sinful patterns we have in our lives are just gonna be eradicated, we're gonna come to one or two false conclusions perhaps One, we may say, I guess I'm not being obedient enough and start beating ourselves up when that may not be the case. Or we may say, hey, I don't get this. I'm trying to deal with my temper. I'm trying to deal with my materialism. I'm trying to deal with how harsh and quick tempered I am or whatever it may be. And God, I'm reading your word. I'm praying. I'm fellowshipping. What is going on here? This is never going to change. Well, It's important that we learn from God's word today what we just saw regarding the people of God in Haggai's day. They were obedient on the 24th day of the sixth month, but the blessings in response to that obedience did not begin to show up until the 24th day of the ninth month. I'll say it again, oftentimes there's a delay between when God's people obey and when God's blessings arrive. Let's pick back up in Haggai chapter two and read the final verses of this book. Haggai 2, 20 through 23. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall go down everyone by the sword of his brother. And listen to verse 23. But on that day, declares the Lord, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord. Well, much the same way, we needed to back up a little bit to understand the first uh, few verses that we looked at from 15 through 19. We're gonna need to back up several decades to understand what exactly is going on here. I mean, we can sort of see that God is saying, I've chosen you, Zerubbabel, who is a governor of Judah, and I'm gonna bless you, and I'm gonna make you like a signet ring. But what exactly is the background? What's going on here? Well. Zerubbabel had a grandfather named Jeconiah or Kaniah. He kind of went by two different names. He had a grandfather named Kaniah who was an extremely wicked man. In fact, he was so wicked that God himself pronounces a curse on Kaniah in the book of Jeremiah 22, 24. Let's see that. Jeremiah 22, 24, God says this, regarding Zerubbabel's grandfather, the wicked king of Judah, Kaniah. Jeremiah 22, 24, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, or Kaniah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would still pull you off. And then in Jeremiah 22, 30, he goes on to say this regarding Kaniah. Thus says the Lord, write this man... That's the wicked king, Kaniah, Zerubbabel's grandfather. Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in all his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. Now, if we go back to Haggai chapter two and look at those last few verses, we can see some connecting language here. Because what's going on in the book of Jeremiah is this. God is saying, due to your disobedience, Kaniah, I'm rejecting you. Though you were like a signet ring, in other words, a symbol that was sort of the seal of the king, that was synonymous with the king, that represented the authority of the king, though you were a signet ring on my hand, Kaniah, 
I would remove you and throw you far away from me. And none of your children, none of your descendants are ever going to sit on the throne and rule over my people. And here we see in the book of Haggai, God is in essence reversing this curse because he says this to Zerubbabel in 23 of Haggai 2. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. God blesses Zerubbabel and reverses this curse in his life that was there due to the sins of his grandfather, Coniah. And it's a good thing that God reverses the curse, not only for Zerubbabel, because that now makes Zerubbabel eligible to rule over God's people, but look at who else was a descendant from wicked King Coniah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 starts this way. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. And if you jump down to verse 12, you'll see in this list of the ancestors leading up to Jesus, it says this, after the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim, that's Kaniah, the wicked grandfather of Zerubbabel, Jehoiakim was the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel was the father of Zerubbabel. And if you continue to read through that passage, you'll see that eventually, finally, it's the father of Joseph and then the father of of Jesus. It's great news, not only for Zerubbabel, that God reverses this curse and therefore makes him eligible to rule over God's people. It appears that by reversing this curse that we saw in Jeremiah, it also makes Jesus himself not be disqualified from being the Messiah, the Savior, and the rightful ruler on the throne of David. And this brings us to our second truth we see in today's passage, and that is this. God's blessings are powerful enough to reverse the curses in our lives. God's blessings are powerful enough to reverse the curses in our lives. And we have just seen that at least some of the time, a source for these curses can be God himself. That certainly was the case with Coniah. But I want to share three other possible sources for the curses that we have in our lives. Those three sources, very briefly, are the following. Generational sin, our own sin, and unknown sources. Let's look at this idea of generational sin. Jeremiah 32, 18 says this. You show unfailing love to thousands but you also bring the consequences of one generation's sin upon the next. What we see in the Bible is at times our parents or our grandparents' sin, or at least their tendency towards certain specific sins, has a way of finding itself into our lives. I'm reminded of the lyrics of a song that say the following, one year, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years down the road in your life, you'll look in the mirror and say, my parents are still alive. And while for many of us, there are many good traits that we have inherited, good tendencies that we've inherited from our parents, I think it's undeniable that oftentimes some of our negative tendencies, oftentimes we see in our parents as well. And I don't quite know how all of this works. I don't know how much of it is environmental. You know, if, if someone has a substance abuse issue, that substance is likely in the house and the children may be more apt to find it. They may see a pattern of people self-medicating through a substance. I don't know how much of it's environmental. I don't know how much of it's genetic. I don't know how much of it's spiritual. But God's word seems pretty clear, and I think it's pretty easy to observe in others that the sins or at least the tendencies towards certain sins of our parents often show up in our lives. So generational sins may be one source of the curses that we have in our lives. The second source may be our own sin. And this passage I'm gonna share with you in just a second has been such a black eye for me because it's been so hard to hear, but I've needed it. You see, I don't know about you, but in my life there are times when I start feeling sorry for myself. 
And I start thinking, God, why am I going through this valley? Why am I going through this trial? Why am I going through this difficult time? But listen to what Proverbs 19.3 says. Proverbs 19.3. People ruin their own lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. (laughs) I believe there have been multiple times in my life or in my heart or in my prayer life I'm asking God, God, why do I have this cross to bear? Why am I in this difficult place? God, why is life so hard right now? Please take me out of this trial or this test. And God stepped back in heaven going, Matt, this has nothing to do with the trial or test. You're just being an idiot right now. And this is what happens when you act foolishly. You see, when we sin, it's like opening the front door and inviting all these curses into our lives So another source for the curses in our lives, in addition to generational sins, may be our own sin, our own folly. But third, I want to give another category, and that may just be what I would call unknown uh, unknown sources, rather. Look at John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. As Jesus was walking along, they saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins? Or his parents' sins, which is what we saw. Was this generational sin? Was this his own sins? Why is he born blind? And in verse 3, Jesus really doesn't give an answer. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, but rather this has happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. You know, regardless of where the curses in our lives come from, if they're generational if they're self-imposed by our own sin, if we honestly don't know how to account for them, regardless of where these curses come from, the good news that we see in the book of Haggai is this. God's blessings are powerful enough to reverse the curses in our lives. To close, I wanna ask one final question, and that is this. What steps can we take What steps can we take so God can break the curses in our lives and bless us? The first and most important step by and far is this, trust in Christ. You see, in the same way the people in Haggai's day, due to their disobedience, brought curses on themselves The Bible says that every single person chooses to do what is selfish and wrong, most of the time knowing better. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, when we disobey God's law, when he says do this and we don't, or he says don't do this and we do it, the Bible says when we disobey God's word, we break his commands, The result of that is we bring curses into our lives. Not only the shame of sin and the guilt of sin, but one day a future penalty for sin into eternity if we die in those sins. But in the same way that our disobedience has gotten us curses, Jesus Christ's obedience has gotten him blessings, because Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, and yet he was without sin. He was perfectly obedient to the Father, and as a result of that, he had all these blessings from God. And what's happening at the cross, when Jesus goes to the cross, is he says, every man and woman in the world, I'm going to make an offer to you. I am willing to swap all the blessings I have coming to me for my perfect obedience towards God the Father. That's eternal life, that's love, joy, peace, patience, that's no guilt of sin, no shame of sin, no penalty of sin. I am willing to swap that out and give that to you by faith if you will give me all of the curses for your sin that have come as a result of your disobedience. And Christ goes to the cross and goes as our substitute the innocent suffering for the guilty, the just suffering the punishment for the unjust so that we can be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to him. Galatians 3.13 puts it beautifully. It puts it this way. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone 
who was hanged on a tree. If you're here today and you've not yet believed in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess that with your mouth, I beg you, do not leave here today until you do so. If you have questions about that following the service, I would invite you to come underneath the cross to your right. We have some men and women that would love to pray for you and answer questions you have. Please don't miss this opportunity. Trust in Christ. Next step, be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, one through two says this. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And if you go on to verse 11, we'll see, it says the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as, not kind of like or similarly to, but just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. What this passage of scripture is teaching us is that every Christian, every genuine Christian has the spirit of God living inside of them. And that spirit of God is a game changer. Because you see, before the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us, we are quite literally unable to overcome our sins and selfish inclinations. But what this passage of scripture is arguing is just as the same Holy Spirit was powerful enough to raise the physical body of Jesus from the dead, that same spirit resides in you. And if it's powerful enough to raise a physical body from the dead, it's able to raise a spiritual body from the dead and enable us to live a life not of sinless perfection, but of growing victory over sin. Be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the game changer that enables us, gives us the power and the energy to be victorious over our sin and the curses that come with that sin. Third, make no provision for the flesh. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Well, what does it mean to make no provision for the flesh? Well, when you provide for something, you look at something down the road in time and say, I wanna take steps now to make something either happen in the future or more likely to happen. I'm gonna try and make provisions for my retirement or make provisions for my kids to go to college or make provisions for a family vacation next year. Whatever it is, you're looking ahead to the future and taking steps right now to set the conditions for something to happen in the future. And God's word is telling us, do not make provision for our flesh, that is our sinful tendencies. Very practical word. I think it's best understood like this. I am not someone who is tempted by gambling, and that is not because I'm virtuous. I'm just way too cheap to waste my money gambling, but there are some people that it's a real temptation, and for some people, I know it's a very powerful, cruel master. Well, if that describes you, if you really have a difficult time not gambling, to make no provision for the flesh means you don't plan next year's vacation to Las Vegas, right? Because what we're doing in that scenario is we are putting ourselves in harm's way. We are making it possible and even likely for our flesh to be indulging in sinful things. Perhaps you deal with discontentment or covetousness or you deal with materialism and there's some app that you have on your smartphone that just breeds discontentment. To make no provision means you delete that thing. You take that app off your phone so that you do not make provisions for your flesh. You don't make provisions for you to indulge in these sinful thoughts and attitudes down the road. Make no provision for the flesh. Fourth and finally, if we're gonna take steps so that God can break the curses in our lives and bless us, we need to know this. We're gonna need to do one thing, and that's persevere. 
God calls us to persevere. God calls us to be people that endure. Galatians 6 verse 9 says this, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Remember we read a little earlier in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that as we plant and water to the Spirit, the Spirit brings about in our life slowly, gradually, over time. Well, what we just read is in the same book, in the same context, and it says, don't grow weary of that process of planting and watering. Don't grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Because we just saw, we are just like the people of God in Haggai's day. On the 24th day of the sixth month, they began to obey and they were obedient day in and day out for three entire months before God's blessings actually arrived and began to materialize. And if we want more self-control, more peace, more patience, more love, more joy in our lives, we need to recognize that we could be doing everything obediently and it just takes time. First two questions we open with. When it comes to God's blessings, will they actually work? Are they able to deliver on their promises? Are they powerful enough to change our lives, even if I have had these well-worn patterns of sin for decades in my life? Are God's blessings enough to deliver on what they promise? Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that liberates us from that sin, Absolutely, God's blessings are powerful enough. Absolutely, they are able to deliver on their promises. Absolutely, they are powerful enough to change our lives. Well, how long should we expect to wait before we see the results of God's blessings after we have obeyed? To that, I'm just gonna say, I don't know, but expect a hold time, expect a waiting period. There are some amazing times where people are instantaneously delivered of some addiction or some temper or some lust or you name it. Those things do happen in the lives of the people of God. But by and large, for most of us, God's spiritual blessings of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of those will be developed gradually as we obey and we would do well to expect a delay in time from when we obey God and when those blessings arrive. The good news is, his blessings will arrive if we don't give up and they are powerful enough to reverse the curses in each and every one of our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the encouragement it contains, Lord. And we thank you that although it's 2,500 years ago and a different continent and different culture and different language, Lord, people really haven't changed all that much. The people of God in Haggai's day seem an awful lot like us. God, they tend to make excuses. In fact, they make the same excuses that we make. God, I pray that you would help us to stop making those excuses and get, get serious about the mission that you have given us. God, I thank you that you encourage us both by your presence and your promises. You are working in us and with us and through us and in spite of us. And as long as we keep holding your hand, it will ultimately be fruitful labor God, your promises are a way for us to have a sampling of the blessings of the future in the present while we're still waiting to see your promises come to fruition. So God, we thank you for those. We thank you for your presence and your promises. And God, today, we thank you for reminding us that your blessings are powerful enough to reverse even the most difficult patterns and curses in our lives God, help us remember that oftentimes when we obey you, there is a lag in time between when we obey and when your blessings arrive. Lord, help us keep that top of mind 
so we don't experience unnecessary discouragement, confusion, and are tempted to throw the towel in, to pull the plug just a day or an hour or a week before we're about to turn the corner and see the fruit of your spiritual blessings. God, help each and every one of us to engage in your mission and to find where we can make the biggest possible impact for your kingdom so that we can make more and better disciples for your glory. Wake up this sleeping giant called the church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.